I'm doing great. Good to talk to you guys. Well, thanks for joining us here. We had this discussion in our last segment. I'll just ask you, for before we get to the nuts and bolts and get you to tee up the series and likes and dislikes, what you think is going to happen, is there anybody that's not specifically an Astros fan that would be cheering for the Astros, just as a casual baseball fan tuning into this World Series? Do you think that's possible? Yeah, that's been a, yeah, that's been a conversation around baseball a little bit here. Yeah, I've, I've been with the Astros since the playoffs began, and they certainly do get their their abuse on the road, you know. Uh, it's just interesting to how how um, uh, boisterous uh, the fans get when when El Tuve, Bregman, or Correa come up. Those are the leftovers from the scandal, and and they really hear it. In fact, in Chicago, I've never seen this before. Um, the Astros were down one nothing in a playoff game. El Tuve got hit by a pitch, and the crowd cheered the tying run getting to first base because they were so happy he got hit by a pitch is the weirdest thing. I mean, and then they lost the game 10 to one, I think. So, um, yeah, it, it, I don't, I don't see anybody really rooting for them. You're right. Um, you know, I'm trying to, I don't think there's like even a player that wasn't on the scandal that everybody kind of gravitates towards. I mean, Jordan Alvarez is a great player, Kyle Tucker, but I haven't seen their personality sort of, um, bringing fans from outside of Houston. So, yeah, I think this is a team that everybody wants to see lose. And you know, there's a lot to like. You know, everybody loves Freddie Freeman. He's kind of America's first baseman. And Brian Snicker's a lifer, although Dusty Baker is as well. So there might be some Dusty Baker fans out there rooting for the Astros. But in general, I think you're, you're right. that This is a team people want to see lose. Um, they want to win, they say, because they love winning. But I think deep down they also want to show the world we can do this without cheating. Yeah, I was going to say, do you think the Astros have been able to kind of have that chip on their shoulder as you know, in a sense of where everyone is against them, and they're, you look at their losses against or the loss against the White Sox earlier, and you know, I think it was Carlos Correa that got really upset after I can't remember which White Sox player kind of called them out about cheating again, and it's something they're always going to wear. But in, in that sense, is everybody hates them? Are they using that kind of heel, uh, I guess, uh, persona to kind of get them through this? Yeah, the way I look at it, it, the answer to that is yes, but they're not having team meetings about it. I don't even think they are talking about it. It's just there. It just it 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 it, it has united them in a strange way. Um, and it, but it, it, I don't think I I do believe that it is it isn't something they necessarily talk about. Now, in those celebratory moments in the locker room or on the field, you know, you know that might come out once in a while or in a post game press conference. Um, so I, I think it just kind of is happening organically. Look, it's us against the world. You're always going to back your teammate no matter what, but especially now that everyone's abusing them so much and rooting against them so much. So even newcomers, I talked to Kendall Graveman the other day. He was traded midseason to them. He, he, he kind of realized that, boy, these guys really have been united through something that was really negative. And Korea, Korea told me the other day, you know, he's like, look, I know it was bad, but every he 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 compared it to a movie. He's like, no movie, you know, starts out happy and ends happy. There's happy, and then there's the plot twist that things go bad, and then it ends hopefully on a happy note. And then he's like, we're trying to, you know, come out of that bad plot twist and end on a happy note. So I guess winning a World Series without the, the hint of a scandal would would do that. Um, and so yeah, I think it's always under the surface, even if they don't talk about it all the time. Jesse, I want to just talk about the Braves for a little bit here, and this is an, another kind of uh, you know uh, talking point that I, I've seen with baseball fans, and we've discussed it on the show, and, and fans that are old enough to remember, like, like me, during the 90s, the Braves were just always in the playoffs. They were such a consistent team, and unfortunately for them, they only have the one World Series to show for it, and not because, like, the Astros thing's a different thing altogether, the whole cheating scandal. But the Braves didn't have a lot of Braves fans outside. They were an easy team to dislike, I think, uh, during during that time here. But now, you look at this Braves team, they've, they've got that kind of underdog feel with all the key injuries that they suffered throughout the season. And the fact that they're in this World Series, uh, opposite to the Astros, this is a team that's kind of easy to get behind because they got that, that true kind of underdog feel to them. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I also think that, and I've, I, I've covered them, but I know people that cover them on a daily basis, uh, and they talk about this is just a really good group to cover. I mean, I'm not saying the Astros are a bad group, but the Astros, um, part of their storyline is this negative scandal that they 
that they have to discuss, and that's an uncomfortable thing. There's nothing negative or uncomfortable to discuss with the Braves. There's no apparent jerks in the locker room. There's a lot of people to root for. So, yes, now you add this underdog story to it, and I think you're right. It kind of is easy to get behind them a lot. Now, some people don't like the name, the nickname or the Tomahawk Chop. That's a whole different issue. But when you talk about the players themselves, the manager, the underdog status, the fact that they had to re- rework their team midseason, all of that plays into sort of, um, I think, a lot of people, uh, making it easy for a lot of people to root for them and obviously root against the Astros. Yeah, and I want to touch again on, on Freddie Freeman. You, you brought him up as, you know, America's, uh, you know, first baseman pretty much. But, you know, we've adopted him as a, as a Canadian as well uh, up here. But just such a likable guy that's done so much for the sport and finally kind of getting some of this, not that he hasn't gotten national recognition, but getting that the spotlight to earn that World Series again. Yeah, and, and just talking to him uh, for one day yesterday, uh, he's probably going to end up being the best quote all week because he's, he, he's back to being a 12 year old kid. You know, it, it just, this is the dream come true. 11 years with the franchise, getting close, never getting there, and then finally breaking through, having another great year after a little bit of a slow start, after having that great 2020 season. Like, this is, this is his time, right? I think on the Astros, it's Carlos Correa's time. He's going to be a free agent. This is uh, Freddie Freeman's time. He's also going to be a free agent. He'll probably will resign. So um, he was like a kid in a candy store yesterday. Now he's a little bit older. He's got a, you know, a kid that was on. You know, he showed, they show the kid Charlie all the time. So, um, yeah, this is kind of going to be his stage, I think, for sure. Uh, the Astros don't have um, too many lefties that they'll throw out there, although Fran Valdez will go tonight. So, you know, Freeman might be able to tee off on some of the righties. Uh, but this is just kind of the guy everybody in that locker room gravitates to and the media gravitates to as well, right? I mean, it's, it's part of it. You know, um, I love what, what, what baseball is trying to do with their Latin American players that don't speak English. I mean, they don't shy away from them. They put them up there and, and bring the translators in and everything. But certainly a guy like Freddie Freeman who, who can give that interview is going to be a guy sought after a lot. And that, that's part of it as well, right? He just, for, for anybody covering, not just Spanish-speaking reporters, not just Spanish-speaking, you know, viewers, um, he's a guy everybody can can gravitate to. But, uh, you know, Jordan Alvarez has got a great personality, but you can't see it as much, you know, when you're talking through the translator and everything like that. But I, I commend baseball. They, they bring those guys in the interview room. They bring the translators in, and they do their best to market them, you know, um, and, and, and there's a lot of Spanish-speaking reporters here as well. But in terms of, you know, the general media, it's, it's a lot of the English people, and, and that, you know, they're going to gravitate to a guy like Freddie Freeman. Jesse Rogers from ESPN is joining us. Let's uh, nuts and bolts this thing here. So it's game one tonight. Uh, give it, give us your pitching assessment for the Astros and the Braves and uh, any advantages there, in your opinion, as we uh, kick off this World Series. Yeah, I'll say this. I, I picked against the Astros last round. I picked Boston. Um, I didn't think Houston could survive without Lance McCullers. Um, boy, did they prove me wrong. Now, for about three games, I was looking, you know, I was correct in that assessment. Boston was having their way. They made some adjustments. I think Martin Maldonado and, and Brent Strom, the Houston pitching coach, are, should have been maybe co-MVPs last series because they really challenged these young pitchers. So I feel like the fact that Framber Valdez, Luis Garcia, and these guys got over the hump last round means they. I don't think I don't see why they would slow down here. Um, granted, it's a, it's an even bigger stage, so I, I give the starting pitching edge to the Astros because of what they did last round in, in, in the last few games there. Um, but I give the bullpen edge to the Braves. Uh, what they show, Tyler Matzik and company, just absolutely amazing out of that pen. Now, Charlie Morton's a little bit of a different animal. He can match any Astro starter, and he's a true, true veteran. So tonight's interesting. Valdez had unbelievable stuff in his last start, and Morton just knows how to navigate his uh, his way through a World Series game. Like if people are asking me, I would take the under in the game. This is one game where I just don't think the offenses are going to do much unless Valdez kind of reverts back to sort of being that scared kind of pitcher that, that some of these young guys end up doing in the postseason. So I think it's going to be a low-scoring game. I only give the Astros an edge in the series because their lineup is just that one extra man or two extra man deeper. You know, the fact that Kyle Tucker bats seven. Now they lose a little bit when they go to the NL Park and the pitcher has to hit. And so I think it, it, the Braves do get a couple wins in, at home, but I think this is going to be an Astros in six or seven series. They're just too good in too many areas. 
and overcoming Lance McCullers' injury, I think, was the key thing last round. I think that continues. Yeah, you look at the other side of it uh, for the Atlanta Braves and the injuries that they have before Ronald Acuna went down. He was absolutely raking. Uh, you know, Mike Soroka, you know, Canadian, we, we were following as well, pitching. Uh, you know, the, Marcelo Zuna, you look at a bunch of their injuries that they have. Are you surprised to see them get to where they did with that? Yes, absolutely. It's the worst of the three or four playoff teams they've had in, in recent times, right? I mean, they were much more lined up in the last few years when Soroka was healthy, when Freed was really, you know, taking the league by storm, um, which he's come on in the last, you know, month or so. But, yeah, completely, completely surprised. I mean, Austin Riley, in, in my mind, sort of came out of nowhere. They were very patient with him. He's had this big season. They have a brand-new outfield. Solaire has COVID, no problem. They go ahead and win the, the Dodgers here. I mean, come on. How could you not be surprised? I, 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 they didn't look like they'd even win the division uh, in August, and, and they go on this run. So that's the strange thing about baseball. The wor- It's absolutely the worst of their playoff teams on paper, yet they've gone the farthest. And that, and- that just tells you what baseball is all about in the postseason. Sorry, Jesse. Just just last point on this, and I'm sure you've been asked this before. You know, covering uh, covering MLB, covering this postseason run here, the World Series is underway, and you know we we are um, we're emerging out of this pandemic. We know how different it was last year. You know, what's the energy like uh, around this World Series uh, that things are somewhat back to normal here? Yeah, I mean, it, it, we haven't gotten going yet. But what, but I could tell you what it was the last round. Okay, it, it was insane. I mean, yeah. people outside the park, the building going, the buildings going crazy. I've been you know home and road for these teams, and uh, people love postseason baseball. Nobody really, except for for reporters, complains about the length of the game. Nobody um, you know is bothered by anything really. It's postseason baseball. Every pitch, you're on the edge of your seat. And now it's going to even you know go up a notch because it's the World Series. And the beautiful thing about about these things is there's always storylines. You know, everybody, you know, a lot of people wanted L.A. Houston the rematch, you know, from the scandal and all that. But there's plenty of storylines here as well. There, you know, Eddie Rosario, right? I mean, come on. Mm. Um, you know, no one much knew about Jordan Alvarez before the ALCS. So uh, it's just yeah, it, it, it's so different with fans. I was at I was in Texas for the World Series last year. You know, they had 10,000, but it was still very strange, very strange. And, and, and I was in the earlier rounds where there were no fans, and that was really strange. Mm-hmm. So we're back to normal. The crowds are amazing. The energy is amazing. Um, nothing like postseason baseball. It's weird because the season is so long. It drags on. By September 15th, I'm done. Let's go. Let's move this thing along. By, maybe by August 15th. But when it comes to o- o- October 15th or October 10th or October 26th, I'm all in. and I love every moment of it. And just final point, just to pick up on what you just said with the fans here. Now, you're there. It's going to be different. You're watching it live here. For the rest of us, we're going to be watching it on TV. Um, part, for years, part of uh, the drama of postseason baseball, baseball is such a moment-to-moment sport. Things slow down between pitches. And it, the way it's shot on TV, part of it is – showing different fans faces somebody's biting their fingernails somebody like somebody's freaking out over here that's part of it right and and when you don't have fans uh it, it just it just wasn't the same it's like the fans are such a big part of any sport in general but I, postseason baseball really really miss the fans to draw you in i feel like every round there's a fan or a group of fans or whatever there's some storyline with the fans like In Chicago, there was a guy with a cane that was using it to put some mojo on the on the opposing pitcher during the playoffs. Like, there's always a a storyline with fans. So you're you're so right about that. And the players say it's night and day. I mean, the energy is night and day. Jock Peterson was in the World Series last year with the Dodgers, and now he's here with the Braves. And uh, I mean, the fans at Truist Park uh, were out of their minds, out of their minds. And he's like, it's just it's two different baseball games. One without fans and one with forty thousand screaming fans. It's just, it's like playing. Think about it. It's like playing behind your house compared to playing in a in a stadium with 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 it full. It's we 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 can all picture what that must be. It's just completely uh, different and 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 definitely more fun, even for for myself, to be in that building because you feel it. You know, you don't you didn't feel it last year. You can feel it um, in these in these playoffs the only time you 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 you, you uh you lose that feel is when there's a blowout if it's nine to two yeah. after and there were and there have been some blowouts in the postseason 
when it's 92 after three innings, you kind of, okay, there's a low. But if it gets close or it's close the whole way, you, you do feel it every pitch. Uh, and some of the best drama in all of sports here. Close baseball game, postseason, packed house, and, and just the nervous energy uh, in the building. So it all gets underway tonight. Can't wait. Uh, game one of the World Series. Jesse, thanks for the preview. Really appreciate you hopping on with us today. Anytime. Take care, guys. There's Jesse Rogers from ESPN on the Gabriel Pizza Hotline. Gabriel Pizza, the official pizza of the Ottawa Senators. All right, we're midway through here. Still to come, uh, lost the